Of course, with COVID, we don't socialize the same as we were able to do. Uh, so you'll know him a bit better after the service. <laughs> and John, will give you a very warm welcome this morning. Delighted to have you in the pulpit. And we look forward to your message. Now, next Sunday is harvest service, as you all know, led by the Reverend Louise McKee. And we're at James and Christine Kennedy's farm, followed by a barbecue. We will meet there at 11 a.m. Don't be coming here now, Sunday morning. So go to the farm. And, uh, uh, and if you fill your reply slip in, it would be appreciated uh, so we can organize lifts and uh, numbers for the barbecue that's, a that's after that. Uh, um, if it's not a good, hopefully the sun will shine, but if it doesn't, bring a coat with you, although it's, it, well, it's well covered in there, you'll be all right, but just bring a coat in case. Um, your um, building features, I don't know, what the, that's the right one for harvest service. Your envelopes are in the pew, so if you would take them home with you and, and bring them next Sunday, it would be appreciated. The Church Bible study will commence on Wednesday, the 6th of October, in the Wesley Hall at 7.30. A Donagadee community mosaic is being made and, will have, and we have been asked to contribute. We have an hour slot for at least 10 people to take part on Tuesday, the 5th of October at 1.15. Hope you took all that in. <laughs> and any questions? See Helen Johnson. I think she has all the answers as far as I know. She knows it. <laughs> Good to see you back with us, Derek, this morning. And yes, yeah. You run down the road, all right? Yes. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, that seems to be all the announcements, and I'll hand over to John. Thank you. Thank you. The one good thing about coming to church on a day like this is that they didn't ask, which is great. Uh, thank you for your kind welcome. As uh, was said, Polly and I have come to the church the last couple of months. Some of you will have known Polly through the walking group, and I'm determined to get a men's walking group going as well, so that's another issue. We come to you from East Belfast Mission, where I was designated a local preacher. Although I'll let you into a secret, I'm not really a preacher, I'm a teacher so it could be slightly different this morning, and also a member of council there. It's interesting to know why we come to church. We come to church to praise and to worship God, and I firmly believe that because we're met here in his name this morning, he's here, here in spirit. So that's our attitude to come to praise and to worship a living God. John 8, 22 says this, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Although a modern translation says this, bearing in mind it's Jesus speaking. If you stick with this, believing in me, living out what I tell you, you are my disciples for sure. Then you will experience for yourselves the truth, and the truth will free you. Let us commit our fellowship together this morning in prayer. Let's pray to God. Let's just be quiet for a moment and think about that. The truth will set you free. God of heaven and earth, we long to be truly free. So in this time of worship, help us to grasp that freedom comes from seeing you more clearly and loving you more dearly and following you more nearly. So Father God, you know what we desire, that we do justice and love kindness and humbly walk with you. So we gather here this morning to remind ourselves of that and to revere one another, to remember that now is always the right time to do these things. So come, Holy Spirit, 
come, come dwell in our hearts this morning. Illuminate our minds and direct our footsteps. And we pray too that day by day that you will give us strength and courage to be your people in this difficult and challenging time we find ourselves in. In this place, in Donagadee, in our homes, or wherever we might find ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, bearing that in mind, we are encouraged to worship God in spirit and in truth, and that's what we're going to do. But another little thing, I'm the sort of person, I'm interested in the what, yes, but more so in why and how. And I have a love for hymns, so I bore a congregation with just a little introduction with regards to each hymn. Our opening praise is To God Be the Glory, and it's a hymn written by Francis Crosby, first published, believe it or not, in 1875. And then it was seen as a great revival hymn, and it's still seen as a great revival hymn today. As you're able, let's stand and worship God. Let's just do that now. Let's come to the Father. Let's just pray to him. And I firmly believe that God answers all prayers. Maybe not in the way we want them, but he hears and answers all prayers for those who truly call upon him. So let's call upon him now in Jesus' name. Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we just pray for ourselves because we've not always lived the ways that reflect 
your love for us. There are times when prejudice and ignorance have caused us to judge others as less important or maybe less capable or less whole than ourselves. Gracious God, release us and grant us mercy. We've not always lived as people assured of our place in God's heart. There are times when despair has been our refuge and we've turned away from God's promises. Gracious God, release us and grant us hope. We've not always lived as disciples of Jesus. There are times when paths to wealth and power have been more attractive than the longer roads of justice, peace and tolerance. Gracious God, release us and grant us courage. We've not always lived as people of the resurrection. There are times when we have only seen the world as a place of threat and brokenness, just forgetting about God's creative genius. Gracious God, release us and grant us wisdom. In the quietness, we remember those thoughts and those actions and words that have marred your image in us and have hurt other, other people and have even damaged your creation. We confess them to you now. So in the silence, let's just take these to God. God, we believe in the silence that you have heard our confession from our hearts and from our minds. In Christ we are set free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Uh, our second praise, um, Soldiers of Christ Arise, is based on Ephesians chapter 6. I find this interesting. Wesley initially wrote this hymn, not as a hymn, but as a poem and it was entitled The Whole Armour of God. Now he wrote it, believe it or not, in 1747 and was used to defend against criticism of Methodism in the United Kingdom. And during their, uh, their careers, both John and Charles Wesley were persecuted, not only verbally, uh, but also in a physical way as well. And because of this, the hymn was written and became known as the Christian's bugle blast because of its military references and the apparent calls to arms when it was set to music. The hymn was published as Soldiers of Christ Arise in 1749. So let's stand as you're able and praise God. Soldiers of Christ Arise. <laughs>
come again in prayer. This time we're going to pray for others. I often find the quickest way to change a relationship from bad to good is to start thanking God in prayer for other people. Praying for them will do two things. It will change your attitude and it will change them. Positive praying, I'm told, and I firmly believe, is more powerful than positive thinking. People may resist our help. They may spurn our appeals. They reject our suggestions. But you know, they're powerless against prayer. Why should we pray for other people? Well, we should pray for others from the heart with deep feeling and sincerity. No glib comments. Sincerity is what God is looking for. We should pray regularly, not just when we're in panic mode. We should pray for others in detail. But you know, God knows everything, but he wants us to come to him with specific requests. And pray for others with faith, knowing that God has all power and loves the people that we are praying for. So bearing all that in mind, this is why we pray for others. So let's just talk to God again. Let's pray for others. Gracious God, may your spirit give strength to all your people as they work and witness for you. In this church here, in our town, in fact in all our villages and towns and cities throughout all of Ireland, north and south, yes, and throughout the world as well, we especially remember the Methodist Church, its ministers and local preachers, and especially our own minister, Louise, and her husband, and those who serve you in many different roles in this place. I just pray that you will grant them your wisdom and your power to lead and to encourage those whom they serve. We pray too for our communities and for all those who live and work in these areas especially in these days of disruption. Lord, help everyone to share all the good gifts that you have given to us. God, our friend, we pray for our family and friends. May we be able to help each other just as you loved and helped us. So in the silence, we especially pray for those known to us. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray now for those in need, for people who are not feeling very well, for those in hospital and those with any other problems, from those suffering poverty and those who are oppressed and are the prisoner, the unemployed, and those in any sort of need. So Lord, in the silence, we especially pray for those known to us. Lord, hear our prayers. Compassionate God, give us your strength and healing to those who are sad or lonely or sick and bless those who try to help them. In the silence, we especially pray for those known to us. Lord, hear our prayers. God of hope, we thank you that not even death can separate us from your love. Blessed are those who mourn, for we know they will be comforted. Loving God, we give this week into your hands, so would you be with us in all that we do? May we enjoy this week and learn and grow in it. So in the silence, we bring to you some of our concerns about this coming week. Lord, hear our prayers. Loving God, you have made all races and nations to be one family. And you sent Jesus to proclaim the good news of salvation. 
not to some but to all people. Pour out your spirit on the whole of creation and hasten the coming of your reign of justice and love among the nations for the world. For God, these things that we have prayed for give us grace to work for. And in the purpose of your love, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes for Jesus' sake. As we respond in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to say, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Our reading this morning, continuing the theme in Ephesians, is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. And some Bibles entitle this, Wear the Full Armor of God. It goes as this, as follows. To end my letter, this is Paul speaking, I tell you, be strong in the Lord and in his great power. Wear the full armor of God. Wear God's armor so that you can fight against the devil's clever tricks. Our fight is not against people on earth. We are fighting against the rulers and authorities and powers of this world's darkness. We are fighting against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly places. That's why you need to get God's full armor. Then, the day, on the day of evil, you will be able to stand strong. And when you finish the whole fight, you will be still standing. So, stand strong with the belt of truth tied around your waist, and on your chest wear the protection of right living. On your feet wear the good news of peace to help you stand strong. And also use the shield of faith with which you can stop all the burning arrows that come from the evil one. Accept God's salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit. The sword is the teaching of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times. Pray with all kinds of prayers and ask for everything you need. To do this, you must always be ready. Never give up. Always pray for all of God's people. Also pray for me that when I speak, God will give me words so that I can tell the secret truth about the good news without fear. I have the work of speaking for that good news and this is what I'm doing now here in prison. Pray that when I tell people the good news, I will speak without fear as I should. I, I work with a lot of guys who are uh, challenging, who were in prison or drug addicts and so on. And they'd say to me, John, see this Bible bit? I just do not understand all these words. Just put it in English for me. So I thought I would do that for you. The message puts it like this, and I think this is interesting. It says, be prepared. You're up against more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon that God has issued, so that when it's all over, bar the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, Faith and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them through your life. God's word is indispensable as a weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and pray long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. That's the sort of language that some folk like, and I think it is really appropriate. Now we come to an interesting part. This is uh, entitled My Reflections. Um, normally I like to use PowerPoint. So if you see me putting my thumb up, don't worry, I'm just saying next one. So there we go, Ephesians. There are many titles for Ephesians. And the one that stands out for me is this, become who you are in Christ become who you are in Christ. If you think back, Paul, what must he have been thinking about in prison? 
He'd wandered around most of uh, the Roman Empire on his journeys, and he'd come to a lot of different places. And he came to Ephesus. Now, there had already been a church in Ephesus set up by the Apostle John. It was small. And he reflected the last time he was in Ephesus, he caused a riot. It was very interesting. He'd go to a place and he caused a riot. So sitting in a cell, I just wonder, if I have to write back to this church, what am I going to say? How am I going to encourage them? And that's what Louise has been doing over the last few weeks. We've been looking at uh, Ephesians. And Paul was trying to suggest, well, this is why we go about doing what we're doing. And this is how you might go about it. And if you've got a problem with anger, maybe you should deal with it in this particular way. And we come now to the last little bit. I'll let you a secret. I was told to do this, but I don't mind. So, here we go. Let's see if it works. Right, armies. What do you think when you think about armies? Well, Paul looking out, obviously the Romans were about, and they were in charge, and they used their muscle quite severely at times. So Paul thinks about that. What do we think about? Maybe it's something like this. A group of guys and ladies who are defending, attacking, or whatever, with all the armament that they have. Here we go. Do we think this is an army? People sitting in pews. Is that an army? Well, there's one group in particular made it their whole particular seat, the Salvation Army. A group of people dedicated to, in inverted commas, fighting for the cause. You become or you enroll as a soldier in their organization and you go through the ranks of sergeant or captain or major or general or whatever. They use the army discipline. They're not interested, dare I say, and I'm not being irreverent here, in communion or baptism. Their fight is through a magazine called War Cry, and they go to the streets to look for people who are in need, particularly those who have come upon hard times, and they specialize in helping people. So here we have armies in front of us, four different types of armies. Now, what are armies made up of? Soldiers. Well, Paul thought, well, here's a soldier that I come across, a Roman, armored, speared, the lot. Or maybe we think of someone like this in modern day, again, with all the gear, only this time they have a rifle. Or maybe it's just ordinary people, men and women, without the armor per se, without the equipment. How do we arm people to be soldiers of Jesus Christ? Now Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 20, has many titles. Here's one. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. But what does that mean? Give me another title. The whole armor of God. Well, we can sort that one out. The warrior. Another title. And as we've been singing about Wesleyanism, soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. So armies are made up of soldiers, but they have to have a particular brief. Now, we bit about Ephesus. You can see there, right smack in the middle of like the Roman Empire. It was an interesting place. It was a place where Greek and Roman culture was the norm. And certainly followers of the way, first Christians, it, that was not the norm. It was a place of perhaps made up of perhaps, we're told, over 250,000 people, which is quite a large city. And it's to that city Paul was writing. And it's interesting to note that after Paul's encouragement, because of its location, it became the core of the seven churches of Asia. So from the small beginnings, from the riots, from the letters, this particular place grew to become a particular church of note. Right. The book of Ephesians 
we're told and we know was written by the Apostle Paul. But why was it written? And as Louise has been trying to take us through, it was right, written to encourage people. It was to make the point that right living pleased God and also because of right living, people should be attracted to their particular way of life. So Paul wrote the message not to stir up fear, but to encourage the believers. Because of God's total provision for us, we can't stop and be dismissive of an enemy. So if that's the case, what do we need? How do we stand fast? Spiritual warfare requires equipping for war. A soldier doesn't go to the Arctic to fight in khaki shorts and a t-shirt. He has the appropriate equipment for doing what he's supposed to do. No soldier engages in warfare without being skilled in the art of warfare. So we need equipping and we need skills. So there must be preparation. Every soldier is in constant training for the day of battle. They don't go to barracks, enjoy themselves, they get the shout, boys, we're away. They're continually honing themselves for a particular event which may or may not happen. But they're in constant training. But the object is not only to withstand, but also to stand. And there's a difference, as I'll explain in a minute or two not only to withstand what's coming, but to stand. Why? Because if we withstand and we stand, we will be victorious. Let's see where I am. So, the armor of God is a metaphor that reminds Christians about a spiritual battle and describes the protection available to them. The full armor of God that Christians are called to put on compri uh, comprises of the belt of truth, the breastplate of salvation, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. Sorry. So, if we look at a basic design and the real design, why are these things, why did Paul refer to them? He comes and talks about the belt of truth. Now again, the illustration will show you that one of the devil's favorite weapons is lies. Often he distorts the truth, and sometimes we find it very difficult to distinguish between the truth and maybe not so truth. There are gray areas that sometimes we become confused and depending on how we're feeling, what way we go. But if we ask God to give us discernment, that's the wisdom to know truth above all else. David Chadwick, who was an author and pastor of one of the big churches in America, says this in his Moments of Hope uh, devotional. The first piece of the armor is the belt of truth. Truth, by its very definition, is exclusive. It means something is true. If that's the case, other things are lies. The evil one is the father of lies. Every lie finds its origin in him. Every other piece of the full armor of God is attached to the belt of truth. If you don't begin with truth, you'll never defeat the enemy. As Jesus said, God's word is true. God's word is true. So, how do we apply the belt of truth? It's all very well reading about it. May I suggest a few things? May I suggest that you pursue the truth in a specific topic? Don't grab the first thing that comes into mind and hold it as scripture. Let me tell you an interesting story. Many years ago, there was a gentleman who was trying to set up a faith tabernacle in Belfast. And I went to one of his meetings 
And, um, and it was interesting. And he came to a certain part of the service and he said, For God so loved the world that he gave, will now have the collection. I went, Excuse me? Excuse me? So sometimes we grasp the bits of scripture and we don't put it in totality and we take out the bits that suit themselves. Two other stories, I'm not full of stories. A guy in Africa had a bear with him and they were out hunting and the bear tripped, the gun went off and he shot his master. And people obviously were very upset. So when they came home, they wanted to make a plaque to him. And they thought of the man and all that he did. And that was great. So they chose the scripture, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I think about it. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Phew, shot, okay, that one's lost. Right, so don't study just parts of the Bible that come easy. Press into the whole of scripture to get everything out of it. Pray God's word. Use the truth as a template to guide your prayers. Memorize the truth. I had an uncle who had a little box, and in the little box were 360 little scrolls. And with the scrolls, he had a little pair of tweezers. And every day, he dipped into the box and pulled out and read the text for the day and prayed that text put it back in again. Now, you might say, well, how did he know which one to pick? He didn't. He might have picked that one up the next day. But the point being is, if you memorize, you know, you make notes, you know what the truth is. And as I said at the beginning, the truth sets you free. Time's going on. I have six of these to go through. Breastplate of righteousness. Satan also undermines our self-worth and our self-value. People say when they get in behind you, they can destroy you. Destroy your mind, destroy your attitudes and values. So the breastplate for an, um, a Roman was very, very important. So we're asked God to remind us, yes, but we're asking him to protect us, to keep what's in our heart meaningful. How we might apply it? Well, May I suggest that we soak up the instructions and obey God's word. Soak it up. Bathe in it. Know what it's about. Ask, if you're not sure, a trusted friend or someone here perhaps to pray for you if you're struggling. And I believe people struggle nearly every day, but sometimes we don't ask for help. We're too proud. But people in God's army are only too willing to come alongside and to pray with you, for you and so on. Satan doesn't like that. But that's what the breastplate is doing. I'll zoom quickly through. Shoes, gospel of peace. Why do the Roman need shoes? Romans marched a long way most of the day and that was their trademark, to march quickly to various places. So much so they actually built roads for them to walk on. So what do we understand by the gospel of peace? I would suggest that these are fitted feet. They're yours, they're nobody else's. You ever get a handy down and they're about one and a half sizes too big for you, but you've got to wear them anyway. So you stuff it with socks and so on. Well, that's not what it's about. The shoes are yours alone for your fitted feet. So Satan wants to keep people of God quiet. So he tries to plant seeds of doubt as well as how we speak or if anyone will listen to us. But if we pray, God will provide strength and boldness to give us time and place and situation to share, to commend our particular faith without worry. In other words, we have peace of mind. Peace is an attribution, uh, an attribute of Jesus, very person and character. In the Greek, peace means oneness or wholeness. It's a slightly different from what we may understand. The gospel, which means good news, is the forgiveness of sin and the access to God through faith. And when we have this, we have peace. 
Shield of faith. Interesting, why did the Romans have a big shield? Two reasons. It defended them forward, and they got into this huddle, if you like, a turtle, and they put it up on top as well. So the shield here and a shield here. And the way they stood together, they were totally protected. Above, front, back, the lot. Now they did an interesting thing uh, before going into battle with the shield of faith. They dipped their shields in water. Why? Well, because when they were fighting, folks fired arrows at them, flaming arrows, but because their shields were soaked, the arrows distinguished extinguished themselves. So what can we learn about that? May I suggest that our personal weakness can leave us, lead us into temptation if we are not protected, our hearts and our minds. So what must we do? If your faith feels less confident than you wish, ask God simply to increase your faith. Find verses that feed your faith and will give you excitement or go ahead or energy or call it what you will to commend who Jesus is. Set your faith in God's character, not in circumstances, which is important. Helmet of salvation. I've shown two helmets because if you're an ordinary soldier, you had the one without all the plumes. If you were of rank, you had one with plumes. But if you take the plumes off, the helmet's more or less the same because it protects your head, your neck, and your face. So the helmet of salvation. Sometimes we struggle with thoughts. Sometimes faulty ideas, anxieties, fears can come in and can be amplified in our minds. And that's what the helmet of salvation is supposed to do. God says that he will renew our minds. He will protect our minds. How might we do this? We are told, may I suggest, Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Remember, the Jesus' character and faithfulness of Scripture should be yours as well. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed or changed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Protect the mind. Here they are. The sword of the spirit. Uh, Satan, hopes, Satan hopes to neutralize the power that we have through Jesus. His aim is to confuse, to intimidate, or even to scare us. But when the devil comes we have this sword which is seen as the word of god to protect ourselves think of the story when jesus was in the desert or the wilderness satan came to tempt him on three occasions how did he defend himself go away satan push off don't want to know you you're stupid you're silly go away no he referred to something that was already there god's word it is written and then he went on to explain on each of three occasions what was written. It was written. So the sword of the spirit. Many years ago in campaigners, we had summer schools. And we had this little lady, a really gracious lady, who made us put our Bibles in our pockets. I thought, this is very strange. What's going on here? And she used to say, sword drill. Excuse me. And you had to bring out your Bible and open it up and read it. And the point that she was trying to make was this was the sword of the spirit. God's word. I put it back in again and so on. Little things like that. And that's what I remember. So the sword of the spirit. Greg Laurie, an author and pastor, says this. When we are tempted, the most effective weapon that God has given us as believers is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So all these particular items... Paul would have seen and in concluding his letter he'll say I'll give them something to remember what this is all about things that they can see every day 
nearly there. So, in summary, if you like, the armor of God, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, the helmet. Okay, put those to one side. Let's look at the attributes of Jesus compared to that of Satan. The belt means truth, lies, righteousness, sin and temptation. Gospel of peace, fear. Faith, doubt. Salvation, condemnation. Little verse says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The sword, the spirit of the word of God, all of the above. So, people should see and know and understand what this is all about. Let me let, give you a little story to finish. A number of years ago, a couple of years in a row, we went to Egypt to work on the school from the dump. And we had this lady with us. She's now 97, Henrietta, gracious lady. While we were getting all our injections and all this sort of thing, Henrietta said, no, I rely on God's word. I pray to God I didn't eat any of this. We did get the Egyptian tummy. She didn't. But anyway, she said to me one morning, John, let me tell you something that you'll find useful in life. And I said, Henrietta, tell me. She said, you put on your clothes in the morning? I said, hope so. Yes, no problem. She said, well, do you put God's armor on with them? I said, no. I've read about it. She said, no. Every morning when I get up and I put in my clothes on, I put on God's armor. We go out for the day. When I come home in the evening, I take it off again to relax in his presence. The next day I get up, I put my armor on. She's 97 and she's still doing it. And that's how much God's armor means to her. And I think it's a good story. So we put on God's armor to stand, to withstand all that's coming to us, but to stand as well. The Romans stood and they moved forward. They stood and they moved forward. And that's what we're encouraged to do in Ephesians. Let's just finish by praying together. Let's pray. Lord, may your church here in Donoghadee be prepared and willing to serve you in whatever way brings glory to your name and advances your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name, the captain of our salvation, we pray. Amen. Our closing praise, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. It's an American Christian hymn. It was written by George Duffield, again, 1858. The challenge is to stand up for Jesus, and he used the metaphors of Ephesians 6 in his hymn. So as we're able, let's stand and conclude our service.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And can we say the grace together, acknowledging one another in Jesus' name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.